Well, welcome, everybody. This is our debut first podcast. I am Andrew Garcia. It's Matt Russell, Thomas Donaldson. Our guest today, Mr. Andy Maholic, writer, comedian, improv, master, choreographer, singer. One. Man's got it all. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. So uh, one of my main reasons I wanted you to have on the, wanted to have you on the show is I wanted to get into how you got to where you are now in your comedy career from like ground zero. Where did you start? Like, because I feel like that's a very common dream among people like i want to be a comedian like i'm funny or i'm naturally funny like how'd you get to where you are not like that at all which is great (laughs) i um i think in seventh grade we'll start officially my comedy career i tried out for a school play because i was in chorus uh and a teacher was like i need someone so i jumped in and i was given the clown role of bailiff in this wacky courtroom scene Um, so I naturally made people laugh my whole life, but then being on a stage and getting laughter, that's a great high. So, but then I was bitten by the theater bug and not the comedy bug, like didn't pick up comedy until very recently. So I did uh, theater throughout high school, went to a small school in Pennsylvania where I'm from, did theater throughout college. And that's where probably my sophomore year, I started to realize when I was on stage with all these other actors, um, realizing that I wasn't like them or that I wasn't um, in it for the same things. I was really enjoying the script and and looking at the words and the meaning and the metaphors and all the things the writer was doing. And when I was in a play or a production, comedy, serious, musical, whatever it was, I was always about like, how can I serve this play? That's what college was kind of teaching me. Okay. So it was ve- I was very like intellectual about it and very literary. <laughs> and deep. Right. It was, you, I was, need su- you needed substance. And then yeah. all my other actors are just like, it's about me, right? <laughs> and that, which is... Okay. Don't you feel like you need that to a certain degree as an actor though? Sure. Like, yeah. No, 100%. Yeah. Hundred percent, and I have that. I don't deny that, but like, <laughs> I have, a, I, I think a healthier balance of that. Who knows what is right? But so they were about their time, and and also their craft, like them themselves making them a tool. And I was really stuck to a fault at times. There were directors who were like, "You're really over analyzing your 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 tool, your body, your voice. That's what you need to work on, mm-hmm. and stop worrying about." The, the whole production as a whole, that's my job as the director. Yep. So once I started to get that note over and over again, I had a, a great teacher who was like, you're a writer. And right. I was like, oh, I do write. you want write. more control. Yeah, yeah. Right. I write all the time. I wrote my whole life. I journaled. I, I always wanted to write. I put on my own works. Um, so, but that was halfway through a theater degree and I'm too fiscally like tight knit to <laughs> Changed majors, so I finished that degree, yeah. knowing the whole time I was a writer. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, so that would be, I graduated in 2013, knowing then I'm going out into the world with a theater degree. I'm a performer with a lot of writing tendencies. So I started working for a couple of theaters. To, I did a lot of lit stuff. I was a literary okay. intern and mm-hmm. all that. Always making people laugh, always drawn to comedy. Then my... Ooh, now husband. I get to say that out loud. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now husband, then just friend, uh, <laughs> moved to Chicago to pursue comedy. I started to enjoy going to those shows so much. And I made a leap. I like made a pretty big leap that I haven't found anyone else who has done this, gone from theater community to comedy community. And it's a yeah. big yeah. jump. I don't know anyone, at least like industry wise, like in Hollywood, like that's got a very known, like, oh, this is where I started, but now I'm just comedy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a that's weird transition. Of, right? There's people yeah. who definitely the blend the, into yeah. both. But to just like leave one and go, it's a whole different world, which I didn't expect that. I just thought this would be a funnier crowd of theater kids. It's not. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's the main difference? Though? I am. Uh, I think when I first got into it, so this would be around 2014, 15 is when I started. I still am like really afraid to ever say I'm a comedian. So I've worked my way up to comedy writer. I feel confident saying that. That's good. Um, yeah. I feel like all artists are scared of titles though. Yeah. Once you say comedian, it's a whole it's different. like, oh, that defines me. Like me I have joke. to be this way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh right. God. Yeah. That's, that's right. It's my nightmare. So <laughs> I, uh, so when I first got it, what's the main difference I would say is when I started to get into it, 
I realized there was a there were two big differences. One was a lack of structure, uh, or or which again theater is all about structure, play structure. Rehearsal schedules are very tight. Everything mm-hmm. you there's can go, you can walk it, yeah. into any production and they're all pretty much the same. And there's a, a bunch of stage management roles. It's very tight. Um, and as an actor, you respect that. That's part of your craft is mm-hmm. knowing that. Comedy has that, but I find a majority of comedians I've worked with way loosey-goosey on that. Like they'll walk in late, they'll leave early, they won't show up, and that's in the industry accepted. So okay. that was a big difference. Hmm. Um, yeah, in our industry, you get fired. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Sorry, bye. <laughs> yeah. No, I walked in and it was a lot of people were like, take the stick out of your ass. Like we, this is, this is how it is. Um, it wasn't until I studied that. Cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I studied. I was it like, you gotta love that though. You gotta love that environment. Or, oh. or, or are you? No, I did. I was drawn to it. I still am drawn to it because I've always known I am too like as I kind of said, I'm too rigid and too intellectual. So yeah, th- this helps you get out of your box. So, it's so great. Yeah, it's like what I think is draw always draws me to comedy. Um, so I did love it, and then I met uh, a teacher, Michael McCarthy, who's a famous IO. Uh, writing teacher, he's amazing. Okay. He was the I. O. first Sorry. guy. I.O. is, yeah, uh, yeah used the formerly the Improv Olympic. Okay. So it's like in Chicago, it's Second City, mm-hmm. and then I.O. is kind of your second uh, okay. school of right. improv okay. comedy. They, they're they both legends um, in academia of comedy. Yeah. So I went to I.O. because I.O. is known for uh, this really all ties together. I'm a one note person. Uh, they have a great syllabus and they have books and they have text. <laughs> and Second City is like, no, we're going to throw you on a stage and right. you're going to sink or swim and don't be yeah. a racist. Like that's the... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was like, no, we'll teach you first yeah, yeah. and then at the end we'll give you the stage. Uh, so okay. I, I was drawn to that. Right from their website you see that. Good. Like Second City writing classes are like, come write with us. And I always like, here Here's is what you will learn. Yeah. So I went, and Michael McCarthy, who created the entire program, I was fortunate to have him as a teacher. Uh, he was the first guy ever to, like, he was like, you guys need structure. You need, and I was like, yes, thank you. <laughs> so he balanced it all out for me. And, and since then, I haven't worried about fitting in or not. I've just done my thing. If you lack optimism, it's game over. Um, yeah, so the whole dream of being a comedian isn't my dream. My dream is to get my work seen. And I have learned through a long process now, over a decade process, that my way of getting myself seen, I want to do my stuff. I've learned that. Mm -hmm. So I like to self-produce my own work. I love to do other people's work too, but I work really well with collaboration and having my voice or my point of view, which is another great thing about comedy versus theater. Theater is more about a, a large idea, whereas comedy at its at its very form is about your point of view and yeah. getting that to an audience. Right. Like this is how I see it and I want you to see it. And if you don't see it, I want you to laugh at how I see it. Yeah, yeah. To, to me, right. comedians are like, society's observers like they just you guys just sit outside and look at everyone like idiots right (laughs) Right. (laughs) exactly show it to you it's like they don't even see what they're doing (laughs) yeah there's nothing better and my my husband and i who he's also he's an he's an improv master that's what he does i'm like i'm the script to his improv like we're very very much so (laughs) to and to the extremes Uh, Um, order and chaos exactly he is an agent (laughs) of chaos like you say that so passionately just trust me it was in our vows it was just like (laughs) yeah it's seen in our home of like i am very like a place for everything and he is like well that can't go where it belongs (laughs) um but we love to go to comedy shows at second city and see we always think like oh my gosh i can't believe what everyone's laughing at it's su- that maybe that is such a basic joke and then to pull back on our egos and say mm-hmm. like oh no we're the outlier we are every everyone else is normal here this we're the weirdos the which is really out, interesting yeah. to us yeah. so that's kind of how i that's why i'm in comedy that's how i ended up here um i'm early i'm early in it that's why yeah. i always hesitate to say comedian Cause, yeah, yeah, because I like because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts naturally, and uh, a lot of comedians. And the one thing is like when they say like, "Oh yeah, dude, I've been in the business like three, four years." Like, dude, you're not a comedian. Like, right? Like, give me ten years right. of like you starving right. and living out of your car. Exactly. They're like, 
then you're a comedian. Right. Because <laughs> it, it's, it's a lot of legwork for comedy, I feel. Yeah. Like, because to build a following, to get people to see things the same way as you and to agree with them and just have it funny. And like, right. It's a lot. And they have to, I just read this interview that I loved. Uh, I'm not going to remember who was in it. But uh, <laughs> the comedian said, like, your audience doesn't know me. They don't trust my voice. Anything I say is just going to be, and she was a, a white woman. I remember that much. And she was saying, uh, like, anything I say is going to be taken out of context or with your beliefs of what a white female comic should say in 2018. So I'm hesitant to say anything. And I thought that was brilliant because that's another element of comedy is you, Kathy Griffin, Louis C.K., we think we know his voice until <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, but, like, uh, these people, you watch them for years and so you know who they are. You you build this platform for them and then you can laugh because you trust them. Yeah. Like John Mulaney, you yeah. know what you're going to get from them or you know their point of view. But, like, for me, people don't know me. So if I put something out there that is either unclear in point of view, which I've done on my blog, like I'll post blogs that people are like, it missed the mark. They have no idea what I even intended to say because they don't know who I am. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they have to understand who you are and that then your point of view actually can come across. Right. It's like, well, he sees this this way. That's why he's right. saying that. You have to get your footing in and, uh, and establish some sort of something first and right. then people start picking up. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, so jumping to a new topic, I wanted to talk about how you develop your ideas, like from inception to like, oh, I got, I think this is a good bit or this is a good joke. Like, how do you test it out? Like, how do you develop it to make sure that it's a polished like piece of work? Sure. Like something from like one of your best shows or one of your best skits. Like, how did you get that from inception to completion? A hundred percent. They all vary. Uh, most of them, it's very rare that I have a spark of an idea and it's a perfect joke. But when I do, they're blackouts, which are, <laughs> if you don't know, do you know what a blackout is? Mm. So a blackout is a, um, it's when you go see a comedy show and it's like a setup punchline and the lights go out and there's usually <laughs> like three in a row. So it's it's just this quick thing. And usually I'm a, I like to say I'm a master. I, I, I can't say I'm a comedian, but I'm a master of blackouts because they are bad puns, most of them. Uh, They're yeah. so... I was going to say, those are the most successful ones in my experience. Like, those are the ones that get me. Yeah. like, And I love them. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Is I'm so drawn to them. When I see a show, I they throw you for a loop. You don't even realize it, what's funny until the light is out and then you're laughing in darkness with a crowd. <laughs> yeah. So those are great. And normally once you have a blackout, if it's good, you laugh immediately to yourself. You write it down. And that shouldn't need Anything polishing. Yeah. And in fact, when you do a show with, uh, if you do a show in a collaboration of like six writers, you have one day where you all bring in, you're supposed to bring in hundreds at a time, but okay. I try to bring in like 12 and be reasonable. <laughs> yeah. But you each, you go around the room and you you just say them. Uh, and you either, it either lands or it doesn't. And you yeah. move on. You don't get to fight for it. You don't get to edit it. And you never go back. Ooh, I like that. Right. Which yeah. is, it, it's that's not how the rest of the world works in sketch comedy yeah. but that's how blackouts work. but you know it's crazy that kind of i um this youtube channel i follow uh corridor digital they have this guy uh carmichael on there and like he's like leaving the show and they're like everyone's going through like what they learned from him and stuff there's one guy he's like kill babies that's what i learned from carmichael and i was just like what <laughs> and, and he just goes and he's like sometimes these ideas we create there are babies. There are children. Like yeah. we love them. Like this is great. It's yeah. so, like every now and then you gotta kill a baby. I kill so many babies. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like it's. Yeah. So, I like the fact that it's just like, oh, it didn't land. Move on. Don't Gone. ever speak of it so again. So talking about creating them, then, then what do you do for inspiration? Like how do you like create like, or what do you look to to create some things? Yeah. So I, all it all draws from point of view. And when I learned that, which for the first time again was at I O in class, like. Writing 101 is they start with saying, pick up a, a, a newspaper, read it, and, and look at it, and what's your point of view, and why is it funny? And that's a lot to digest to try and say, like, okay. why is that funny? Then they said, what's your point of view on it? And you write that out, and that's where I always start. And then I learned, uh, like, two years ago, I was on a bus, and I'll never forget this moment, but I was on a, a just a CTA bus on my way to work, and some white girl was doing something that I found so ridiculous and stereotypical of a white girl 
on a bus yeah. that so I, you, I was like, you are being that stereotype yeah. right that now. I, yes, yeah. that I wanted to say something. And I remember I rolled my eyes. I was so, mm. I was so dramatic. I was like, oh, <laughs> and when I rolled my eyes, my little writer brain went, when you roll your eyes, that's something to write about. And I've never let that go. Mm -hmm. So now every time my body has a reaction of like, ugh, I always go like, oh my God, where's my pen? Like, write that down. That's good. That's where ideas start. That's a good rule, yeah. Yeah, so when I read something and I have a reaction to it, it's an idea. I might not know what that is or how to make it funny. And oftentimes it's not funny right away because it's mean. (laughs) It's it's usually like when, you know, when someone does this and so you have to then analyze your own point of view <laughs> yeah. and say like, what am I really upset about here? Yeah. I'm not really upset at white women uh, yeah. for this. I'm yeah. upset the, the everything else. So uh, that's kind of where it starts. And then you, you take a scenario comedy and uh, this is hard because then it's, then it's um, a buffet. And, and this is where I think it's uh, Stephen King says like writers are put on this earth to tell one story and they just tell it over and over and over again. With comedy, I think that might still be true, yeah. but you have to pick then with the topic, what is your best mode of writing that out? And there's a million different things. Like, is it okay. a two-person character? Is it a mother-son scene where we talk about masturbation? Or is it a, a scene on a bus with five people and we talk about masturbation? Like, what is, <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. the, or is it a monologue? That's how you figure out all the details. Details. So yeah. it just depends. And that kind of, you have to wait till that comes to you. But what I do is I keep a journal of all the, um, all those moments, and then all the like funny scenarios. And at some point they intersect, and you say, "Oh, I can take that and put it into this, and it's funny. It's a twist, and it, yeah. that's kind of where that goes." Nice. Yeah, I like cause something similar to what I started doing because I've been trying to get into writing, as you know, and mm-hmm. I've I just listed out like because I used to back in my younger partying days like I used to always tell like crazy stories because like I used to do a lot of random crazy things and I would always I noticed that I was naturally a good storyteller like on the spot in front of people yeah like I can't write it out and tell you a story but I can like act it out be in the moment and like make you picture it yeah like I'm good at that and I've noticed I was like I have a good library of stories so I just started like bullet point listing them out and the thing was like how can I tell Yes, on paper, always. <laughs> I, I, he, we were getting into this earlier. I can't. Right, I don't. I, I don't like. I don't like typing things out. And you do. Well, you've, you've got very nice handwriting. Well, I touch too, paper, so. but I mean, I think it's 2019. You know, you got to digitize everything. things, and it's easier everything. to share, make edits, and you know, organize. It's definitely, definitely it, for collaborating. Hundred you know? percent. But like, agree. I, I understand like the tactile feel of drawing because like I do ink work, so I mean like yeah, you know I, I, you I, I totally understand it, but at the same time, just like. I don't know. It's 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 2019. You got to keep things digital I now. I don't disagree with you. Like I was saying earlier, it's it's more just a, a memory thing. That's how I remember my notes. Because if I type something, I'm a robot. I don't know what I'm typing. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just this type, this type. When I'm writing it, I can always remember me writing it. Down. Yeah, see where it's at. On exactly. The page like in memory. yeah, well, because like, I'm planning where I'm putting it. I how think I'm aesthetically it. too. You've got you're writing on graph paper oh, with your nice hand paper. I love graph paper. <laughs> graph paper is for godly. everything. Yeah. You know, see, I could never write on graph paper. That's, <laughs> it's weird. To it's me. A, but like, see, <laughs> see these lines. Like he's got lines on the grid paper. Oh yeah. And that's no, what I, mean, I do when I separate. His calendar looks pretty great it's, for uh, this podcast. But like, I just think it's funny. That Is like it, he it, literally it. just drew out a calendar I, I, rather than just going to your Google <laughs> yeah, calendar I, I or whatever, you, you know, and just be like yeah, boom, 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 and then I can share it instead of he like he drew it out, took a photo, you know what else? sent a Facebook message. I'm faster <laughs> writing than I am typing and formatting on documents. But yeah, man, I think you should go back to faxing. I mean, I'm, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm on my way. I'm on my know. way. I've, you know, I've <laughs> sent I've sent one fax ever in my life. Oh yeah, one. It was uh, for unemployment. I can, honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I can honestly, I don't think I've no, ever I needed to fax so anything. Yeah. yeah. How, how old are you, Andy? I'm 28. 
All right. So, yeah. So, you know what a fax is. All right. So, I, you know, I think it's funny that, like, Time you know, out. if I you talk crazy to, that like, you had someone... to ask that question to see. <laughs> well, no, I'm just, I'm just curious. Fax, five, fax is know, not a word. I, I, I don't judge. Like, no, but, like, you know, um, I think it's interesting that many people don't, like, you know, especially the younger age. Like, if you want to confuse, like, a young person, be like, yo, fax that to me. And they'll be like, what? It's like a crack. Yeah, 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 it's exactly. like a text, but it's real paper. Yeah. Like, I mean, I like... <laughs> So like know, our family had one, you know? <laughs> but my, I was talking to my dad about that um, this weekend, and he was saying that like Warren, I think, you know, don't quote me on this, <laughs> but I think Warren Buffett still uses fax because no one can trace faxes, I guess, or no one can intercept <laughs> faxes. Right? You know, you know I what I, you know what I heard about Bill Murray? <laughs> he all his scripts get sent to a Kinkos by his house. He okay. does. He doesn't get anything sent to him. He doesn't have a phone number. They're like he doesn't have anywhere. Like oh, people, people send scripts to a Kinkos. That's right? like I heard it on a, a podcast maybe, and they were just like, "I want to be that Kinkos employee." I was like, "Dude, that dude holds the keys to the gates." <laughs> like, right, right, right. like Mr. Murray, you really want to do this one? Trust me. Like I just, I just read the first ten pages. It's all you. <laughs> he like he knows the industry. He's yeah. Like, Turns out he wrote it. Yeah. I don't like, want to say there's a Caddyshack oh. two coming out. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty good Oh, job. no, that'd be great. <laughs> How funny. Um, I don't have a, I don't think I have a hard feeling about your paper versus iPad technique. Uh, and that's the thing, is like, I can, I can do both, but I just prefer paper because that's. I'm a mess with it I, too much. Because I love drawing. Like, I love drawing. Sure. Painting is hit or miss. Like, I love watercolors. Like, I love inking. Yeah, no, I, love I was like, but pencil, doodling, drawing, <laughs> like, that's calming to me. That's like sure. therapy yeah. to me. So, like, I'd naturally just write it and typing it. I've never developed that. Feel. Like, you know how some people get, have that. that per- yeah. I've always been a poker. Yeah. I'm, I'm efficient and I'm fast at, at it. The keyboard. But I make a million mistakes. So it's like, okay, fix that, fix that, fix that, fix that. When compared to this, I was like, oh, I don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm mind. already done. But, but like, is that your crutch though? Like, you know, like the same thing. Like, I'm not a touch typist as well. Like, I'm mm-hmm. like you. Like, I poke and like I've gotten since I spent so much time in front exactly. of the computer I've gotten better at it and mm-hmm. I'm somewhat a touch typist now I've gotten Same better way. but you know I've been afraid of learning touch you know touch typing just because it's just like you know it's just one other thing to learn you know right, sure. and but you know it's like maybe it's like one of those things that we should be like you know it's 2019 we should you know know how to freaking type on a keyboard because i mean i've seen people like look at something on the screen and just like go like this and i'm like oh they're so fast i I wish i could be that person and you know because it's so much quicker writing that i do that they have free yeah they'll talk to you and they're like oh yeah so i just made a dissertation does anyone know i used to know i remember that in like third grade that that was like Everyone competed against each other. I think you do? I remember, like, I gave up after like a month. Yeah, I was, was just like, no, I'm not that good. Things, like, I think I'm 160. Is that good? I think that's. Oh, I can't remember. I want to say that's good. I'm probably like an 80. Uh, I want to say like 80s, 90s, probably. I remember when I took it, they were like, whoa, but not <laughs> like. <laughs> really good. Great. I was like, I don't want to say I'm amazing, but. I could do I like 180 talk. very sloppily, but if yeah. I'm accurate, I'm. A good well, one. For, too. What was it? The quick brown fox jumps over. Yeah, yeah. brown yeah. dog. Or yeah. Just keep yeah. typing the fairy tale until. The- <laughs> 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 for an After Effects user, I'm not constantly going. Shit, <laughs> just gonna. You know, I'm going poom, pa poom, palm. High keys, man. It feels but like you're c- um, control you shift again? command. Like that again. But that's why I can't use. See, I don't even know what it's called. Uh, digital Photoshop. I can't use it because it's so slow and tedious to me yeah. to like change. Yeah, no. I can't even. Attempt. Yeah, there's a, there's it's, a different flow. Uh, well, in all honesty, it depends if you on what you're doing it. Have you ever tried Lightroom? No. Lightroom <laughs> is, not even is pretend. super easy. If you're yeah. just doing like photo corrections and like not actually like Photoshop, like, oh, I want to replace heads or like nice. put a pyramid in this background. Like anything other than like true Photoshopping in the yeah. sense, like they pretty much simplified the design and made it super easy sliders for like what it's you need seamless. as a photographer. 
And like Adobe has done a fabulous job. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. if, you I know, that's that what you're do- if that's what you're doing, <laughs> it might be a program worth checking out. You know? I yeah. this is where it goes back. I think we said this before we were rolling, but like I would just pay someone to do it, and you could <laughs> use that instead of Photoshop, and I would be like, "That's unbelievable." Like, I <laughs> Very <recommend>. good. <laughs> yes. Like this is perfect. I can't. I really think I'm a captain, like on this boat. <laughs> that's why. Uh, that's why I, I really love getting technical with uh, with people because like they get lost right. They get lost, Sounds and it's really fun to do. But like, if I'm doing like a freelance gig and I'm talking to the client, and I'll tell them how I just saved two hours by switching methods, they're gonna yeah, be like, like, "Okay, cool. does that cost yeah. less?" Yeah. Yes, I yeah, saved you two less is, hours. Exactly. That's how <laughs> that's you need to word it to them. And I was like, yeah. "I just saved you guys two two billable hours." Right. Yeah, right. That's, all we like, <laughs> that's a good technique. It was like, "Ah, oh, you're the best. Yeah. You are the best." Right. Right. <laughs> Before they even see the video. Yeah. <laughs> I know um, Nick Campbell, um, who runs Grayscale yeah. Gorilla, he had a pretty good podcast of um, how to talk um, client speak, pretty yeah. much. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, they don't care, you know, if you like how you did it or like, oh, I did this little thing, did this right. little thing. They don't care about that. They That's just so want, like, it, the client wrong. wants to um, know, like, you know, how can you communicate to the client so that they actually understand? So right, he was right. saying, talk to the client through feelings how do they feel Mm -hmm. so it's like this scene i tried to represent someone sitting in a warm fire you come home you feel that warmth you know that's something that everyone can understand you know that that feeling of sitting in front of the fire everyone can relate to that Mm -hmm. so it's like you know it's choosing your words carefully and articulating it in a way that you know someone can understand and anyone can understand it i think you you do depending on your client though and i've seen this happen is that you then though have to be able to tell your client at some point depending on the client that it did take time right oh, right because well, then there's yeah. people because yeah. i know nothing about photoshop so you oh. can say to me like oh adding a pyramid would take me five minutes or you could say to me well right. that will take me a day and i don't know yeah. and yeah, and that's a magic wand tool it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's and yeah. for someone who knows nothing it is true it's like my worst nightmare is when i take my car into the shop and they Want to? I don't mind if you explain to me that I need to replace my tires, but if you explain to me how you Why? need to replace my tires, <laughs> right, that's the worst. So it's like that delicate balance where I hate to see artists get, and I've just seen it happen to different people, where you kind of get bulldozed by a client who goes like, I'm not paying you for that. That shouldn't have taken that long. And then it's, mm-hmm. yeah, you've it's, dealt with feelings this whole time and now you have to get technical. It's a communication thing. Yeah. Like that's, and that's huge in collaborating. Like, right. If, if you, you guys need to be on the same page and like, speaking of what you said about emotion, like that, that to me, I, I've learned in my experience that like, that's king when it comes to art directing, like any type of specific with clients. Cause like every client's different. Every person is different. What they see as this is not what you see as that, yeah. you know? So you have to develop a language between each other. And I feel like one of the most common understood languages is emotion. You know, so it's like, I want to feel happier. I want to feel inspired. This and like, people can relate to feelings. And it's just like, oh yeah, unless you're dead inside the robot, you know? (laughs) Yeah. But like, (laughs) what do you speak of? I found that you talk to uh, clients the same way you talk to producers. Oh God, yeah. Yeah. uh, Because they basically are your client. Yeah. They're they're the middleman to the client. Right. Because they're like, just tell me what I need to know to tell them. (laughs) Right. Right. Like, because at uh, my last job, I uh, I, uh, had a great producer who always said, you know, shit's due now. You got to do this thing with the deadlines moved, all this kind of shit. And I'm explaining to him why I can't do it. Like, Physically, yeah, not yeah, yeah, can't yeah. do it, but like that's not gonna be able to. You know, and then I'm basically I got to the point in our uh, producer editor relationship where I was telling him what to tell them. Right. I was like, <laughs> just say that that the render is going to it. yeah yeah, and he was like, okay, and I had realized he didn't know very much about what I was Sick, doing, so yeah. I could say almost anything. <laughs> yeah, to you for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> he still texts me every once in a while. He texts me on uh, New Year's Eve. He said, uh, "Happy New Year's." It's like, man, I miss that guy. <laughs> like, cause it's just he was a great producer in the sense of like getting shit Dude, stay done. Stay in touch with him. Like that's yeah. Oh that's yeah. One thing I've learned about our industry, it's like you cannot work at that same place, but you can still keep in touch with people that either inspire you or people that like. Right. For me specifically, it's just like oh, I work well with this guy, or yeah. like 
when I'm working when I'm working with this guy, it's not work to me. Like right. we're just having yeah. fun and doing what we do. I mean, I think that um, like who you know is super important. Like it's all about who you know. I think it, like that spreads throughout every single industry. I mean, I don't oh, know yeah. about you. No, 70% of my it's, work you know, I'm sure from someone I know. exactly. Yeah. And like Networking, and man. what even like nailed it, you know, f- for me cuz I know sometimes some of our um, careers some overlap, but I was you know, it's a little bit random, but I was watching Narcos. I don't know if you guys well, watched Comic-Con, Narcos, yeah, but, but the new season three showed like Didn't the beginning the of uh, the Mexican cartel. Oh, and it heard. literally started about like this guy, like who he knew mm-hmm. and like all these stars sort of aligned because he knew X, Y, and Z and got this mm-hmm. cartel thing going. And it's like, yeah, literally, no I matter who that. you are, it's about who you know. Even right. what can, yeah, even that. if you're it's, a drug it's cartel. who you know and what can you do with who you know. Even yeah. for Pablo Escobar. Well, you got to have a vision. Well, of course, he had a vision. Like, but, like it's crazy because, like, I'm relating to that, but through this podcast, because, like, I, it's like I know all these people. Like, all my friends are crazy talented. Like, yeah. every one of them are great at what they do in their own respect. And, like, every time I hang out with them, like, I just hail their praise. I was like, dude, you're awesome. Like, tell me how you do what you do. And I was just like, how, what do I do with this network? Like, how do I make it beneficial? How do, what do I, and I was just like, let's just do what we always do. Just talk and hang out and learn yeah. from each other. And yeah. like, that's what I wanted out of this. Yeah. From the writer perspective, I, it's still that. I think, I yeah. think you're hundred percent right. It's that no matter what you're in, even in the drug cartel. I love that. Uh, <laughs> it's universal. <laughs> that's so good. But like the writer journey is so in it, it, on purpose, like alone. Mm-hmm. But then you, there's that whole other element, and I think that is so. I'm in a good field between theater and then comedy. Comedy is about people, and it's like you have to. I wrote in a room, and I still write every day, like in a room with the door closed. Don't talk to me. But that that can only go so far. You can't even in any genre of writing. You can't even write in a vacuum. You have to go out and experience the world. Mm-hmm. Like my dream would be to live in a log cabin with a dog in yeah. the middle of nowhere. But what what am I going to write about? Like right. I don't know anything. Or, yeah. So, so if you that's like the Henry, thing though. Henry David uh, Thoreau. hundred yeah. percent. Isn't that and crazy? Because I, like, right. I find yes. so many <laughs> right. creatives and artists that like have that same kind of like retirement dream. Just like alone that's in the it. mountains away from everyone. Just my animals and people I like. And that's it. Like I don't want yeah. But it's like it's crazy because artists in general like the things we create hinge so much on people and society and like what's happening in our world and it's just like we need them to do what we do it's it's funny that you say that you had to like lock yourself away in the room i feel like i guess as a creative i don't know and like you know at least with me you can guys pitch in um, if you know if you do i also had to sort of lock my way in a room and just learn like you know especially during college i know my buddies would be pounding on the door being like yo let's go to this party let's do this or that Mm -hmm. and you know i was locked in my way learning tutorials you know video co-pilot uh you know grayscale gorilla you know just learning stuff and you know even like uh you know when i mentioned henry david throw and he wrote walden you know like every i think artist sort of like wants that escape but at the same time at the end of Walden he expressed that like it's really about people and interacting with people and I feel like you know is that sort of like a path of an artist going like hey I need to sort of isolate myself focus on my art a little bit and then sort of realize that you know maybe I should you know branch out and you know bring in people again once again because you know you can go a little stir crazy you know being by yourself so much i think the log cabin dream that is consistent through so many writers whatever that is is though when you're a writer your job or what you're like your heart is telling you to do is to observe and tell but there's a reason that you're telling right it's to solve something or to help something something out and i think for me at least the log cabin dream which isn't real and i would never want that (laughs) i don't fish i I do love wi-fi and shopping and society the hook and skin it for me (laughs) and turn it into a hamburger and get it like i don't want that but i think what that is is that you are seeing that your job would be done, that there would be nothing left for you to comment on, so you get to go out in the woods and be alone and wait for the invisible creatures with the blindfold bird box. Right <laughs> <laughs> I haven't um, seen that yet. Oh, sorry. No spoilers. No, 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 no spoilers. But like, is, would you recommend that? Uh, highly. Yes. I. Okay. This is right. here. I'm going to put this on public record. My brother will love this. <laughs> I love 
the movie The Happening. Mm-hmm. M. Night Shyamalan's. Okay. I don't think that's a terrible movie. I no. I enjoy that movie. Is The Happening movie. the one with the trees? Yes. yes. All right. So, I thought that was pretty, like some the, of those the, the scenes. Lawnmower. <laughs> the lawnmower. Uh, right? Or is that? Mark Wahlberg. Right? Yeah. Is he's there, in that it's one. Like they were walking I worked at the movie the theater at the time. I walked into the door and all I saw was a lawnmower driving over someone's body. And I was like, I, leaving. There's, <laughs> another, there's another movie with Yeah, that horror movie too. Where kids are killing their parents did that too. Yeah, yeah what's that called? Uh, anyway. Sin- it's called Sinister. Yeah, no. Sinister. You're Sinister. right. Sinister. Oh, Sinister. Oh, I also worked okay. at a that. movie rental store, so I'm <laughs> keen on it. Right on it. Um, I have no I idea like where Sinister. I was on that. <laughs> Log cabins. Oh, so that's what I think that is. Um, but the solitary. <laughs> <laughs> the solitary, for the writing of it, at least, or I'm sure for you guys, well, you need silence to edit your stuff. You can't do right. that in chaos at yeah. a bar. <laughs> you can't get what? used to a lot of people talking and you still like completely focused focus on making a cut. Accurately. I want to yell at people to go shut up, sure. but you know, yeah. it's like, uh, sorry, I have to do this while you're talking to me. Uh, so sometimes you get good at it, but see, I prefer I can, silence. I can, <laughs> I can converse in no problem when it comes to um, motion graphics and yeah. designing. That I can do easy, like just, yeah, yeah, well, I can do a chaos yeah. around me, no problem. But when it comes to editing specifically, like you're messing with audio, you're messing with playback, and it's like it's, you gotta pay a lot there's more pacing, attention. Pacing, like you gotta get people's like rhythm of speaking right. right. It's just like I was like, I need all the focus for this sure. so it can sound natural. But have you have either you guys have like taken yourself like you know like hey I had to like separate myself and just like mm-hmm. focus on my like art or like craft. At oh, all, definitely. Ever. Yeah, uh, I think part of my process tends to be. Uh, you know, whether it is physically closing a door or something and spending several hours at it. But always at some point, if I run into an issue or if I'm done with something or done with something, I uh, I, I just look at someone near me and I say, what looks like shit here? Because uh, that's the question I always ask because I'm hoping that the answer is, I don't see anything because I'm I see everything. No, I see no, all exactly. the things that yeah. could be wrong. So and uh, and I'm surrounded by people who do similar sorts of creative stuff, and they usually have a pretty good eye at going like, I think right there there's a little problem there, and I'm like, perfect. Do you all and do you know that? And you're lying to yourself in that like no one else will notice that, and yeah. you just need to check that no one else yes. will notice. Yes, yes. it's usually I, in I my cupboard. So much. Yeah. So much. I feel so like much. as an artist, we're our own like worst self critics. Oh, right. You know, I think like yeah, you know, I, was, I feel like I was, that's part of all of us. Yeah, you know? I was telling Dominic earlier that. Uh, the other day, I For was running on. No, Dominic. Dominic is our sound guy. Yeah, the, Dominic is the the man behind <laughs> yeah, the audio. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Say hi, Dominic. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> but um, I was I was telling him I was like I was on like an hour and a half of sleep the other day. I was like, what? Why? Like, it's like I I was just working on stuff for the podcast. Like I was getting stuff together. I was designing and doing a little animatics. And then it was like two thirty, and I'm like. I'm almost done with it. Just finish it. Just finish it. Just go the rest of the way. Got to 3.30 and I was like, all right, it's done. And I was like, uh, I kind of see this. You know what? I should probably change. Yeah, I'm going to change that. Push that, out. that. You know what? <laughs> Screw it. I can knock that out quick. I already did it once. This hit like 4.30 and I was like, it's not what I wanted. I got to go it's, back. <laughs> fuck it. I'm going back. I'm going back. <laughs> and, and then it's 5.30 and I'm like, Cool, I'm gonna lay in bed for an hour and close my eyes. Like yeah. that's it I, I yeah. can't walk away. Now, like do you feel the same way? Like I feel like, you know, um, once again, I guess um three fourths of us here um on the sitting at the table are motion graphics artists. Not so I mean so um, <laughs> you know I feel like in our industry we always sometimes can almost polish it forever. You know, like if we yeah. were given infinite of time, we could probably, do you feel the same way about like a joke? Or like what you were saying sometimes, like sometimes you're like, all right, this is it. Yeah, it. You don't need to play with it anymore. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld has the best uh, one view of that. And then literally, I think everyone else has their own view. Uh, but Jerry Seinfeld would say that, that, no, there is a point where the joke is perfect and that's what he works for. Mm-hmm. Every single word, syllable count, uh, if it starts with a K or a P because those letters are funnier to the human ear, mm-hmm. like how many of those are in there? And he does that and then he gives the same joke every night forever. And But his whole philosophy is like, yeah. 
people don't come for the joke, which I find he works so hard for a perfect joke, yeah. and then he says, well, they don't come for the I joke, was about they come to, to see me. That kind of right. contradicts itself, he's, right? Yeah. But I'm like, well, you're Jerry But he's Seinfeld. Jerry so Seinfeld of course, at the end of the you day. You have a specific <laughs> yeah. view of what it's is. It's absolutely, I went and saw Jerry Seinfeld. Last <laughs> right, yeah. and then everyone else, um, even big names that I've seen in their interviews, call him out on that, and they say like, no, if I'm bad, no one's going to care yeah. and they constantly evolve their material. I think that's just a humility thing. So, all like, Because right. I feel like Jerry Seinfeld has already proven himself and he does not care and he's just like yeah, no. Yeah. I, he's, he's, I, he's I just gone. perfect it and I am who yeah. I am. Right. Well, that is. Like, who, who, what does he have to prove to anybody? I would know? answer it like this. This would be um, <clears throat> when I got to comedy I was from theater and that's what this whole thing is like. I learned, oh my God, in theater, you respect the written word. You would never improvise on the playwright. You right. would never yeah. change a word. You work tirelessly, like as an actor, it's insane how much energy you put into getting that sentence correct, especially yeah. in Shakespeare. Yeah. But the even, cadence, yeah. even if you wrote out, a play yeah. and I'm in it, yeah. I'm gonna get every word right. And when you have the experience of working with the playwright, which I've had only three or four times, it's incredible because you get to ask, but when you do, it's this, you put that writer, they're like so above you. And you you gently ask like, I am confused or yeah. about this. Because you don't want to offend. And you you yeah. are so careful around them. And normally, hun I'd say like 95% of the time, they're like, oh no, it's because of this. And it's yeah. a very specific choice. Here's your motivation. Because that's why, what writers yeah. are, yeah. Unless you're in a Calculated. workshop production and the writer is like, yes, good point. Let me see. Because I did say she had a cat here and now I'm saying she hates cats. Yeah. What is that? Right, right. In comedy. That's my biggest fear in all of writing. I was like, I'd have so many inconsistencies. Yeah, you yeah. have to. <laughs> right. And that, that can happen. But in comedy, uh, what I learned immediately is that that's not the case. Every, every comedian who's – so I produce a lot of my own work and mm -hmm. I like to hire casts and, and, and make it collaborative. So it's not just me. Mm -hmm. But what I found immediately is like – Every single comedian loves to improvise your work, change, flat out change the punchline, keep your setup, change the end. Mm -hmm. uh, or ju they just love change. They love fresh feelings. So if you rehearse something, even though I as a director who have been watching a group uh, perform for six weeks know that it's now so precise that it's hilarious, they're, it's so precise that they're bored. And then yeah. you get an audience and so they change your joke. And you, nothing will put me on fire faster. <laughs> um, yeah. I was about to say, like, how do you respond to so that? You had asked me, like, what my craziest – that that's where that comes into oh, play. Is yeah. They're all those stories. But I am of the opinion – I think most comedians are cool with it until you're in front of the audience and it hasn't been, like, established that that's okay to do. Um and I think improv is great. And I actually encourage, so if I hand you, if you guys are my cast and I hand you my sketch show and it's 10 sketches and I cast you all how I want, we are gonna have definitely more than one rehearsal where you get to all improvise the crap out of it. Okay. Like you can take yes. the core of it and go with it. Yeah, yes and, yes, yes and. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's right, yes and, yes that's and. what it is. Right. Yes, I forgot. And right. if I don't do that, I'm doing myself a disservice. <laughs> Or if you, because that's new avenues you haven't thought of, right? A you're, million. You're flushing and also, things out. You're all hilarious people, arguably funnier than me. Yeah, the right? thing I was like, at the so end of the day, I wrote not this all joke ten months ago. Yeah. You get out there, you add a limp to the character or uh, mm -hmm. whatever. It's a little quirk. Yeah. And suddenly, there's new jokes to be told. There's fresher. I write a joke right. about, I don't know, Taylor Swift, and who cares about her right now? This happened, and so you add a new joke, and it's if I don't do that. I don't see why, what's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me though, if you don't, if you wait, if we do it the same and then you wait until there's an audience and then you have your moment, one, it has always flopped. Every single time it flops in front of the audience because you're nervous as the performer, you know exactly what you're doing. You think yeah. you're going to get away with it, but you've never said it out loud. So you either stutter <laughs> through it, you forget it, or you go midway through and you try and go back to my joke and it doesn't work and it always flops. And then I always feel great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm 100% okay with all of this. Um, so that's <laughs> my feelings on, you work, you as, as a writer you work, and every writer I know, you work really hard to get it as close to perfect as possible. You do have to watch yourself and I've worked with so many writers, you get the whole spectrum. 
of course, I think I'm at a, a pretty good even keel of like, I kill babies when I can, but I'm precious sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes I'm wrongly precious about, and my husband is so good at pointing that out. To it. He's like, it's so good though. Yeah, my um, Devin will every time be like, no, it's garbage. You're married to it. It's going to be garbage. Go ahead. <laughs> go, go to rehearsal. Yeah. Put like, it in no, front please, of other people. This, yes. And he's always Fall right. He's always right. And it's, make sure you videotape it. Yeah. <laughs> he's always right. I'm always embarrassed. And then in the rehearsal room, I'm always like, well, I'm trying to go for, and the minute you explain a joke. Yeah. Exactly. It's no longer fun. The, right like, there, you're like, oh, burn no. this and we'll yeah. move on. Right. <laughs> or I have said to, and again, it's all about like, you're in the room with better, funnier people. Okay, like you read it and you just I've say. I've people don't even need to be better or funnier or like more different. talented than you. It's just different perspective. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. like they may not be right, but their whatever they just said sparked some other new idea. That, yeah, that mm. or they're pointing something out just by saying like this might not. Call attention to something. Yeah. Then there's oh, obviously that. a weak spot. If they want to change it, there's probably a reason why. Yeah, there's probably an issue with it yeah. at that point. Yeah. But you work really hard to, to perfect a joke. But I don't, I don't know if I believe other than blackouts, that any joke is like ever perfect or solid. Gotcha. Right. And you know that when you hand it from one actor to the next, and it worked so well with you, and this actor doesn't work with at all. Then you realize it can't be a perfect joke because then it would always land. So when you say that you created like a, a perfect joke, do you, it, is there a line that you say, what can be a joke? Because I know that's oh, definitely God. talked about, you know, in, in a lot of, you know, Everywhere, and it's like, it's, what can be a joke? It's a can very you, PC world right yeah. now. Call out culture. Can you, you know, I know a lot of comedians won't even go to colleges anymore because they're like, I can't even the, open my mouth without, you know, someone offended. Yeah, you Bill know? Burr won't do like, them. Can I don't you, think Hannibal does them you know, anymore. Is making uh. jokes about, you know, uh, Holocaust funny, you know, pedophilia, you know, <laughs> like rape, you know, mm -hmm. like are these funny, like, you know, you're a comedian. Because then people you know, say like, write, oh, well, like, what do you funny, think? What, you know? Like, you know, this obviously, you know, it doesn't say like what everyone should say. This is just your opinion. opinion. Yeah. yeah. How what, do you what, see what do you it? think? I'm, I'm as nervous as everyone else in the world about it, but I am of the mindset that if it's your, if you're a comedian and it's your point of view uh, and you're willing to say it out loud in front of thousands of people, then you should or be even allowed. Twelve people, like yeah, yeah. you're saying it in public, man. I'm at like, thirty <laughs> <laughs> per show. Thank you. It's very hard to get there. <laughs> God, uh, I think you should be allowed to say it once. Uh, once, just once. once. Once, you should absolutely be allowed to say it once and see how it goes. If, if it doesn't work, then don't then do it again. Stressed. Then, yeah. then you ask why it doesn't work. Right. Because if you're at a Catholic university and you try an abortion <laughs> joke and it doesn't land, you go elsewhere. And if those people also, you need to be self-aware. Right. Yeah. Um, because Who's eventually, and very, I, I say eventually, but I think very quickly, you will uh, know whether you're a piece of shit or not for your point right. of view. I, the university thing is interesting because I just, on our, this is so bad, here it goes again, armchair expert with Dax, he has a... <laughs> Uh, an expert on call-out culture come on, and they talk about how this just started in the year 2014, which was one year after I graduated from college, that colleges for the first time handed their speakers a list of things that they could or could not talk about. And it was the first time in our in American history where universities weren't open-minded. They, they were suddenly censoring. protective yeah. of yeah. their students. And so I think that's actually not an issue with comedy at all. I think that's an issue with universities. Yeah. I call out culture is so da dangerous right now in my perspective, but that's that's my thing is if you're a comedian, that means that you have a specific point of view, you believe you should be heard, so you should get to say it, but other people do have the right to react to it. Yeah. If so you don't want to yeah. go to a certain yeah. place because that's not a safe place for you, I don't fault you for that. Like if a if a comedian says, I'm not going there because you won't appreciate it, you'll turn it, it's bad press for me. I'll go elsewhere where people will appreciate so me. You'll ruin my career. Because, like, there are comedians out there right now that are taking big bumps to their career yeah. because of bullshit they've said in the past. Right, right. You know, and that's and another dangerous. Yeah, oh, everything's God, on Twitter. Yeah, right. it's. Yeah. Especially this podcast. Everything will be held against you. <laughs> I, <agree. laughs> I actually cannot wait. <laughs> what else can I say? <laughs> I, f I feel like with those dangerous jokes, 
the the only time that I like them is when they're actually funny. They have to be funny. They have to be funny. But what's funny though? Like who? I mean, to me, what's funny? funny is a subjective. Art is in the eye of the beholder. You yeah. know, like no. what, what? that's From very what true. A person might think, yeah, exactly. Might be think it's funny, and like, well, I guess my style style humor, funny. If, if I had to explain it in a more vague term, it would be you know structurally or like just something that that did make me laugh. Not like uh, not just being like. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Just being over the top gratuitous yeah. or or just shock, you know, shock comedy. Shock or comedy annoys I, me. I feel like well, it's getting a little. <laughs> I was like, it's got a well, soft spot. So one of the big... <laughs> I was like, I like it. Uh, depends. It tends. Like it's, you know, shock comedy Sometimes. can be very like touch and go, I mm-hmm. feel like. But it's so cheap to me, though. Where it's Not like, always. I feel like it's too easy. Not always. Not always. If it's perfectly timed, and I think it. Yeah. Perfectly executed. South like, Park is great at shock comedy. Yeah. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll give you that. That's uh, fair point. All say, right, yeah. I should say, I do think before anyone gets up on a stage, this is this is uh, believing that every comedian who attempts to get up in front of people, when I say like everyone should get on the stage and be able to say whatever they want first, that is assuming that the person getting on that stage is a decent, at least moral, somewhat human. Mm-hmm. And, but if they're not, then that should happen immediately. Right. But I do think before you get on that stage, you should know um, who you're who you're aiming your joke at. Yeah. So I guess what Definitely. I'm saying yeah. does depend on the comedian. And now I'm like backtracking, but right. it, it's that I I like to assume that anyone who's going to get on a stage understands when they wrote that joke, who that joke is aimed at. And right. I think in stand up comedy, if I may. There's always a feud on Facebook of right. stand-ups versus like improv, but I think stand-up comics uh, oh, produce get into that. produce faster, and so sometimes they do misstep or they have a joke and they maybe haven't thought out their point of view. It hap- that happens to me too. I just I have the luxury of like before it hits a stage, we rehearse it so that exactly. it's called can, out or or something or you it's can drawn refine. out. But I I do think every joke. What makes it okay or not is is who you're aiming your punchline at, and if right. you're aiming it at a vi- the victim, right? Or someone put it this way: as, as the person with lesser power. Yeah, punching down. If you're punching down, or if if you're aiming at the person who has less power, whatever that means, mm-hmm. usually you're you're wrong unless you're pointing out why they have the lesser power, and you're actually trying to help them by saying like, right. "Hey, all you people who don't have any power, I wonder yeah. if this is why." Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Just right. laugh mm-hmm. about it. It's, yeah. a, it's satire uh, as a form of uh, representation, not physically punching. You're like, you're going in for the punch, but then showing them a piece of paper. And stuff. Yeah. You're calling out the, the, the truth to it. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's sensitive. Yeah. But go, going back to what you're saying about uh, improv versus uh, stand-up. stand-up, like, uh oh. <laughs> what, what, what do you feel are the best strengths and weaknesses for each? Like, where do they thrive and where do they just like, oh, these people fall flat when it comes to this? Oh, I don't know if I qualify. <laughs> um, <laughs> just in your observation, because you, you, none of us are experts. We're all, we're all just observing. No, I'm trying to think what you mean, is. though. Stand up, where do they, where where, do they where generally do you, where fall flat? Where do stand ups thrive over uh, improv and where does improv thrive over stand ups? Like, just like, what have you seen? Like, oh, improv people are way better at this compared to comed- or to stand-up oh. comedians. I don't know. I I guess improv to me, I am always so impressed by improv because it's not. I'm terrified of improv. I'm terrified of getting up on stage and not knowing what I'm about to do. Um, <laughs> the way my anxiety works, that's <laughs> that's death. That's the worst. <laughs> that's, um, that's death. <laughs> so they excel just at that of just um, knowing that there's a few rules, and as long as they work it within those rules. But not knowing that who their partner is or what their partner is going to say and having to dig out of holes. And right. that's amazing to me. Um, whereas stand-up strength, I think stand-ups also take a higher risk because it's you at that microphone. So you are owning every word. There's right. no reason if you fail. It's a solo act and you do, a collaboration. And you yeah. do fail. Stand-ups Oh, you God, have to. Yeah. Oh yeah. For years. Unless you're not a stand-up unless you bombed. You get right. one, and that's your whole process is like, well, I have one good joke and then I have four more minutes. So you test out new material, like you're gonna just bomb. Right. That's ter- that's that's a strength of courage of your, Tell me your worst point of view. Bomb. Yeah, I was gonna say my worst I, bomb. I want to hear your worst bomb. Yeah, your fail. Tell us about a fail. What did you learn up. from it? <laughs> 
failure. <laughs> um, <laughs> my happens. worst bomb ever, they normally come out of um, like stage fright, which I somehow still get. I have a degree in theater, but like it happens. I'm Things sure, happen. Yeah. Everybody gets scared, man. It's... Uh, I think my biggest weakness is sometimes I worry so much what, about everyone else in the room and I don't realize that I haven't. Oops. Like, and yourself. then I worry about you, 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 you get out there, you're fine. And I'm like, oh, right. I, I had a monologue to do. <laughs> um, very recently, I just, um, oh, that wasn't it. I've saved it. I was going to say, I forgot words to a song mid verse. And I, but I just made something up and I couldn't tell you what came out of my mouth, but it was fine. <laughs> it worked. Half Don't, my castmates went me. back and were like, look oh at that God. asshole. And the other <laughs> half were like, that was fine. Nothing happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, the worst, the shame that I still carry is back in my theater days, I had a duet with a girl and she, it meant so much to her. Her parents traveled for it. Uh, <laughs> precious. So, pre <laughs> did you like that, that <laughs> synchronized? Yeah. Oh. Isn't that, that, you see why I carry guilt? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And you should. <laughs> and I do. Forever. But it was just that classic case of, um, she did her entire verse beautifully. It was so, we rehearsed it. There was no reason this should have happened. Did her whole verse. And then the piano is just vamping and vamping and vamping. And rather than make any choice, I just stood there. Oh. I could forever. Mm. Uh, and it never recovered. It was like the biggest shame of my life. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> that was, well, so was a your, huge fail. What was your takeaway from that? Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually now. So now I have so many tricks. <laughs> Don't fail. Don't do that. I actually have a lot of tricks when I get on stage, and it's been a while. One, I have to stay on stage. I've learned like I can't take two years off from being on stage, or I'm new. I'm yeah. yeah. I can't take a year off. I can't take my muscle like memory, any, man. Like, yeah, it's, it's a like real it's thing. Like any industry, like yeah. you have to be constantly doing it right. almost every day in order to be sharp. You have you know? to yeah. learning to remember to breathe, to keep your footing without locking your knees so you don't pass out. Your hands yeah. will shake, uh, words, all of that comes words. out. So I now, like, if you come watch me on a stage, you will see every once in a while, I will, like, press my fingers, just, like, two of them, so hard together. And it's a it's a way so to... white-knuckle it, huh? You're, Not the whole knuckle. <laughs> it's usually one finger on, like, one hand. And it's very, it's very that always means that it's either something I'm nervous about doing, because, yeah. you know... I perform in other writers' works that I, I don't always like, you like agree a hawk with. At your next 100%. Show. <laughs> <laughs> that is my way of saying, like, you're in this make believe world, but you are like, the pressure keeps you in the now. So you're able to just, for me, I'm always like, you're a real person in this moment. So don't get lost in whatever right. else is happening. Don't get trapped up in there. Because normally it's in there. You just, I was on the, the time that I said I recently just forgot words in a song. It was because, again, the over analyst in me. I'm the third verse, and the first two verses both started with the word there, but they were two different versions of the word there, like there and they are. And I the had a hated word. I had a there. third verse. My first my first word started with the word there. So I hear the first person saying I'm waiting. I hear the second person saying I go, oh, that also starts with there. What does my verse start with there? Oh my gosh, isn't that interesting? Suddenly it's my turn to speak, and I just know the word oh. there. Because I, uh, I left. You, that's that's all you put in the yeah. forefront so of your mind. So the fingers are that's the present. You... Don't go there. Brain who loves to see words on paper wow, in your brain. That's crazy. Because I I, re I relate to that in a scary, freakish way. Yeah. Specifically when it comes to reading. Like, I am a self-proclaimed terrible reader. Like, I, I've i read, like, novel-wise, I've read maybe five novels my entire life. Really? What? And then there were none. Ender's Game, Lord of the Flies... All right, you got some good ones. Uh, at, least, at, least, there, at least the five you've read. Fantasy. All right, hold on. Keep, keep going. Um, they better be good. Those last two. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, yes. Right. Okay. Um, the entire Game of Thrones series. <laughs> no, <laughs> stop. Um, what's... Uh, uh, good Night Moon? <laughs> no. It's 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 uh, Tom and Huck. All right. Huckleberry Finn. Finn, Huckleberry Finn, Finn like Tom Sawyer. That, yeah, yeah. 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 So, that's like, that's literally like my reading career. Yeah. That right there. It's funny that you And it's purely that. because, like, in the first like 10, 20 pages or in the first synopsis, like that idea got me. Where I was like, I want to know more. I want to know where right. this is going. Like, get, like that. Ender's Game and Lord of the Flies specifically, and even Tom. It's it's put kids in a situation with zero parents, what do they do? Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, you force them to become men. You force them to become right. adults. And like, right. I love that concept. I love that. Oh, and uh, The Last Game. That's, that's a short story, though. 
Um, it counts. It's a story. That's fine. <laughs> yes, I, had, my, on I read story comics again. religiously. I love comic books. Like I read oh, yeah. comics right. nonstop. Yeah. But that's got imagery and pictures. And the reason why, like, I love that is because it sets the scene for me. I don't have to imagine it's anything. It's a movie. You're- when I'm when I'm reading a novel, I'm so vivid. I imagine mm-hmm. that entire scene in my head, and because it's so vivid and real to me, I'm in there, and I can read no problem. Like I can speed read quick. But my forefront of my brain, right. my conscious brain is to reading, the words. but my subconscious is just exploring the world <laughs> I, I just built in my brain. That's a writer's yeah. dream. Though. And I'm just like, yeah. I'm like, I was like, oh, this saloon's cool. I wonder what's upstairs. If I went upstairs, there's probably all these rooms and doing that. Like, right. and then I'm reading. I was like, and then he shot him in the face. I'm like, whoa, wait, what just what happened? Just miss? <laughs> Seven pages yeah. back. And I'm like, oh, so okay. You didn't worry, well. read Harry Potter? No. That's my question. What? Didn't read Harry Potter. So I'm not, not saying Harry Potter is the best, but. No, like, no. Uh, and I have though. a reverence and respect for Harry Potter. Potter. Like, I'm just saying a lot of people have read that. I know. And because like, they said it's, it's relatable and it's easy and to it, take in. I just. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn is also one of the very few books that I still have on my bookshelf. Oh. Um, and I'm actually reading a, a book currently called Huck Out West, which is actually pretty interesting. It's not written by Mark Twain, but it's okay. written by, um, I can't remember. Is it a like, retelling or a continuation? No, no, I, it's or? a continuation. Okay. I, I, I can't remember. I'll, you know, it'll be in the podcast notes, but <laughs> yeah. I'll um, put it in there. But it's made by someone else, another author, but he pretty much continues the story right where Huckleberry Finn left off. So Tom Sawyer okay. and Huckleberry Finn go out west when everyone's going out west. So it talks about, you know, finding gold and, you know, going into the wagons, worrying about like the Union soldiers and then pretty much the extermination of the Indians. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Huck friends in Indian and whatnot and it's 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 a very interesting story and like learning you know sort of human mentality but also just reminding yourself of like what it took to go out west and like yeah. you know also yeah. just like it's Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer that's what I'm saying like, like uh, know, those two characters just yeah like, they caught me where I was like that's a crazy combo like I want to know where this goes interesting you know even though it wasn't written by Mark Twain yeah. you know the, he did a very good job about like doing the vernacular that yeah. Mark Twain was so good at and like yeah. Huckleberry's um, you know just how he speaks and like you know it's just like alright that's Huckleberry you Finn. know what's crazy that story uh, the, the original the only reason I actually did read it because I was an avid Pink Monkey Spark Notes like I cheated on every reading test I could <laughs> possibly do because I nice. knew at an early age I was like I, I suck at reading like I it's not that I suck at I reading. It's just like I knew that I was I was not good at it, and like I didn't have the patience to reread things over and over. I was like, no, I'd rather spend my time doing something else. So I was like, Pink Monkey, give me the synopsis, and then from there, I can Sherlock Holmes deduce right. answers to questions. Right. You know, yeah. that was my way of That's reading. A good skill too. But, but the it same works. Time, like now that, all right, now thinking about it, do you ever wish you did read a story? You know, like, Dude, I, I mean, you missed a lot That's, of obviously. No, good I, I, I am 100% like in, not regret, but like, I definitely feel like I'm missing out on a lot. Yeah. Because like, I know that the written word is powerful in its own right. Because like, like we were saying earlier, like you get that inner monologue of people's thought process and like what they're thinking in this moment that they just created. Like right. that, that to me, like I love that aspect. It's just, I hate that I don't have the the fortitude to like focus on it and be like, right. this is what I'm reading. This is what I'm grasping. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm too lost in my own thoughts of creation and making yeah. nonsense. When, yeah, I was like a goody two shoe. Like I yeah. always, you liked I reading. Always, I well, not, uh, I don't know if I liked reading. Well, I guess er, I do like reading because goody two shoes in artist, the sense you didn't cheat on tests like I, I like, did. Um, <laughs> no, not necessarily. But like, um, he's like every now know, and then, hey man. You know, but. Um, you know, I do like being, I guess, escape into a new world. I think any artist that's my sort biggest of, thing. you know, yeah. like if you're able to it's read like something fantasy. and like yep. go into you, that's one, of, I guess, one of the reasons why I like fantasy. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons why I like really Harry Potter a lot, um, you know, it's just like 
I got into this world, and then when mm-hmm. I closed the book, I'm like, oh man, reality sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know? like I mean, like you- I really liked those things, and like especially there was even books that I kept from high school. You know, when I read one of my favorite books was The Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, that's, oh, a, yeah. that's an amazing you know? story. Just yeah, in general. I mean, like you know, like, the movie I think yeah, is amazing. You guys? I like, love that movie. Like, I mean, you guys cheated. So yes. how about you? <laughs> what, what is your okay f- what, you know, <laughs> what is your favorite book? Or like, you know. I am the complete. I'm like an avid reader still to this day. Okay, so, yeah, so what are your I love books? to take those like lists. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird is just an amazing book. And when I read, yep. uh, I ask you that because when I meet people who haven't read it, I actually will buy you a copy. And, uh, <laughs> You're like, please read. I please will please find read. you yeah. until you read that no, book. Uh, that's an amazing story. It's like, it's a great book. I feel like people need like that should be a rite of passage. Like you should. That's read that. I think so like, too. That's a strong, powerful story. I didn't cheat on that one. I good. actually read that one through, and that was a very good story. See, good. Yeah. 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 So that one, that was my fave. I hate that. I was just at the Writers Museum the other day, and it has like all their guests put in their top 10 favorite books and Kill Mockingbird's number one. I'm like, damn it, I'm like everybody else. It <laughs> kills me. Um, but it's a great book and I also think Harper Lee, the author, is such a specific, she's the example of that whole idea of writers write their whole lives to tell one story. She wrote one book, she put it out there, it was perfect. Her town, it was perfect. For the rest of her life, every year, her town threw her a parade. She never went, she died. It's just like, she was good. She wrote a book. Yeah. And that's just like, Ugh. The dream. <laughs> um, but I'm a huge, uh, Poe is where I got okay. into, like Poe is where I was like, oh, That's I'm an intellectual. I, I you could still... loved Poe. Oh, okay, good. Because the short stories, yeah. poem, like, loved. to me, what, what made Poe so easy to read was he was so detailed in building the, the imagery of yes. where you're at. It was just like, it was freakish to the point where I was like, oh, I don't have to do any imagining or yeah. thinking. Like, I know exactly where I'm at. Right. And that was... The, mood, very that cool. was the only writing project I like still remember to this day where I got an A on and I was proud of it. And it was because it was like, write a short story like Edgar Allan Poe. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, I could do this. I just need to say what I'm seeing in my head. Right. And write, yeah. like, it's literally Active. just like, set the scene, set the mood. And I was like, I can do that. That's great. I love yeah. Edgar Allan Poe. When, when you said that the written word was so powerful, I think... Uh, through for a long time, I had a, a hard time reading. I would read just like you, and then rather than maybe exploring the word, if it's a, if it's a tough book or just reading in general, I would start you know doing shit in my brain that wasn't the book and have to yeah, reread. Yeah. So when I read through uh, the Game of Thrones series, The Song of Ice and Fire, uh, that's a hard fucking read because there's, to say, there's like a like thousand. You, you just said you're not characters. a reader, and then you read Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> Started with the audiobook. I followed along with the audiobook. It was like my mom reading to me. Uh, Except it was, was uh, it? I forget the, no, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, not in those scenes. Uh, yeah, I forget the guy's name who did the uh, who did the audiobook, but he did all the voices for the characters. Like Tyrion's was, hello, every, you know, he was very <laughs> gnomish. Fingers, that, like, oh, that, I, I, oh, salad oh, figures. I, I, I was wondering, I was like, I was like yeah. what's his name? Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict Cumberbatch. That's what I was saying. I was like, I, I, I think that's a reference I don't know, so I'm not going to attack you on it. <laughs> no, no. Hubert Cumberdale Cumberbatch. is one of the things. That's salad, salad fingers. I, oh, yeah. No yeah. way. Right. Yeah, Dude, yeah. I, I think you showed me that. God, salad fingers. I bet you it was either me or Jared. Was it was definitely you or Jared. Yeah. Party. Just like, sure turn it on. What haven't you seen? Yeah. I haven't seen it in a million years. That's College. I haven't seen that since college, man. Oh, my God. So when when I read through... Uh, finally, it took years to get through the third book because uh, mm-hmm. that one's where it starts getting really hung up. Uh, and then I finished the rest of it. But after I finished that, I was like, you know, set the book down. There's a lot of shit going on. The, the show was going on at the same time. So that also mm-hmm. helped kind of differentiate yeah, yeah. characters. But then what, what had happened was I, was I wasn't done reading it. I was thinking about it forever because there's a million fucking things going on in that book. <laughs> and then I went to the subreddit where it's the, a discussion of all the theories and shit. I, I read it's every so fucking theory there was, <laughs> mostly because the job I had was a fucking shit job where I'd finished <laughs> my work in two hours and I just sat there on my hands. So I was like, cool, Reddit. <laughs> so... After I started reading these theories, I was like, I might, I, I started writing my own theories because I was like, wow. And then that's when I started getting good at speaking to people. Oh, really? Because when I started writing things down, I got 
uh, more succinct. I, I, I started pausing and thinking about the words I'm saying. Because when I speak, a lot of times I don't know what the fuck I'm going to say. But I'm listening to myself at yeah, the same see, I'm time. Cool with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I'm starting to hit the, you know, if I say the wrong word now, I can be like, nope, whoops, scratch I can that. Fix it. <laughs> right, right. So I'm writing as I'm speaking. So I found that when I started writing things down, I actually became a better communicator. Uh, do you sort of get that sort of feeling when you're oh, when 100%. you're writing? A hundred percent. If I try and explain if I'm in a setting and a, an idea pops into my brain and I just try to immediately explain it, mm -hmm. uh, the whole room will say, no, thank you. Right. But if I have <laughs> one moment to write it out and fix three words, just right. like you said, I can sell, I can pitch an idea yeah. just like that. But uh, yeah, hundred percent. It feels, I feel, I feel like this is uh, whatever, but uh, I feel like something really important for people to learn, even if it's the first thing you do in high school would be a communication class. Just listening yeah. to people, and more importantly, listening to yourself speak. Because yeah. when I started listening to myself speak, that's when I started paying attention to what other people were saying. You that's know? so hard for so many people, is to listen without planning what you're Absorb. going to say. Right. Yeah. That's, and I think we're, we're all at fault to different scenarios of that, but... Because mm -hmm. everyone's got an opinion on something. You but know? the like, people who are on the extreme, that they can't, you can't have a conversation with them because right. they're worried about, yeah, yeah. that drives me crazy. Yeah, um, I, I, I found that such a valuable skill because yeah. especially in today's uh, political climate and uh, I have nothing to do but pay attention to it. So now I can actually, you know, fervently describe how I feel about things and, I, and, yeah. and communicate with people. And it's made me a better person. Just reading Game of Thrones and writing my own theories somehow came out. <laughs> the beauty a, of Game of Thrones. I know. It was like, what? This is crazy. Uh, I... For me, it's 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 more of a when it comes to communicating, it's like I've always naturally been able to just speak naturally, like right here, right in front of you. Like let's let's talk this out. I can do this right here. I can self edit in the moment, and I can say what I want. But if you want me to like email you what I'm thinking or text you what that I'm thinking, time. I hate my life that is because because so be, it's, it's I, I feel so disingenuous, so fake, because it's just like, I wouldn't say that, or that's not how I say that. Right. It's like, I say things this way. I talk this way, which is, I speak in an unconventional way. Like, I don't yeah. speak proper grammar and this and that. But, like, when you write, you want proper grammar so people can understand <laughs> what you're in saying. In a work email, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But it's nothing better, email. though, than sending an email to a friend that's like, check this shit out. <laughs> <laughs> it yes. feels so dangerous. So like, <laughs> this is an email, but I'm colloquially speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I get that. And then I, like, that. fix it for proper grammar. Right, there's, there's a comma missing. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta fix that. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> yeah, no, writing, I, like, the star. Like, oh, this yeah. is what I meant. <laughs> writing a work email can be so dangerous, though, because... And I, I fucking hate writing work emails because you're you're sitting there, you're trying to describe a thing. My work emails are like but four words. I'm always thinking, ooh, that could be red wrong. Yeah, no, um, and that's red right. wrong. It's so it's so enjoyable though. It's so juicy. <laughs> when you get a good God. one, when, no, like it's like go it's, it's like so gossip wrong. without gossip. <laughs> God, yeah. I love nothing more than like writing it to the, that's it. Like writing it so <laughs> yeah. it's perfect and like you might misinterpret it as me thinking you're a bitch, but guess what? That's what I really mean. <laughs> <laughs> or do I? There's nothing you right, it out. but I didn't it's say it, so a, you can't fire me. I love so so, so kind of where I was saying like it, it to me, like speaking, I feel more genuine and rather than yeah. like, so with that, it's more like an anonymity, anonymity. 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 Yeah. There you go. Thank I you. It. It's 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 where it's like, I'm saying this, but you might or you might not get it. I'm gonna leave that up to you. Right. Because you can. Well, for me, it's like I can do that in person, and sometimes it can be very satisfying to like tell you to go to hell, but enjoy the trip. And sometimes <laughs> I can convey that off the cuff. But God, in an email, I can make that work, and yeah. I can print it out and frame it, and <laughs> and you can forward it to your bot. Like I just love, I live for that. It's that's a, great. If you get it My well crafted is enough, per your email, that, right? That's what, per your email, clearly yeah. you're an idiot and didn't see what I wrote earlier. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> 
Yeah. If you get it well crafted enough, you cover your own footsteps just enough to where if that person had to forward it along and say something like, I think this person's telling me off. It's like, yeah, but the words but they here say, aren't. Please, Andrew, <laughs> they have say a please. wonderful day. Yeah. So, so it's like, yeah, I was you telling you off, but you what can't if get just, me for it. Yeah. Like, what if they are just a bitch, but they don't know they're being a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> that's me. I'm, that's true. what I, I intend for you to read it and think I'm either like full of myself or. But you think that it's not, you think I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like You yeah, just yeah. think I'm an, an ass, yeah. but I don't know I'm an ass. Meanwhile, I know oh, I'm an ass. Yeah. I love that. All right. Well, we are running pretty close to that time frame. I want to cool. slowly wrap this up. What's the time and, frame? Um, What's, where are we at? Right yeah, Dama, where are we at time-wise? Uh, an hour 17. Nice. Right, yeah, right, so right. Pretty, we, we, got, we got some good info, uh-huh. and we had that little break, so... Um, I want to wrap things up with just a crazy story, wild work story or industry story, whatever. Yes. Yeah. I love this. I yes. love that you asked for this. I immediately. Because <laughs> everyone's got one. Yes. You but know, we I all have that thought, story. This is a terrible question for a writer because our whole goal <laughs> is to be alone in a room. And so when you were asked that, I was like, I don't know. I went to Starbucks without a pen one time. <laughs> So I chose, though, I chose, and I tried, I chose to lean into something where I was the writer, but I was also the director and producer uh, of my own show. This was very recent. This was in the last year. Mm -hmm. I had, so I wrote a full show about weddings because I was getting married and it's all I could write about. Like every comedic thing was about the the industry. For better, for uh, For better, you're the worst. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I wrote it. I had a full script on my own. It felt great. I cast six people in it. Some I knew, some I didn't. Mm -hmm. We went through the whole process and I was the, so I was the writer, director, producer, and you hold a lot of power there and you have to like be careful and you have to- You're the showrunner. Right. And everyone at that point, it's it's your, not only your words, but you're telling them what to do. It's a delicate balance. It's It's just great. It's a great challenge. And if you do it well, it's a lot of fun because you do hold that power and everyone respects you in the room kind of immediately but you can lose it very quickly, too, if you're an asshole, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I was fortunate. I never lost that cast. They were, like, so they were amazing. Um, and I, again, as I mentioned earlier, we let them improvise, and we we had fun. And they got to add their own things into the script. So it, it felt like our show by Tech. Mm-hmm. So Tech is, uh, at Second City, where I produce the show, you get one night of Tech, and it's the week of your show. So you have to have all your shit together okay. so that you get, basically, you get two hours, you meet the stage manager, and they go through lights and sounds. And it's not about you. It's about Tech. Yeah. Um, but you get to do, like, we call it tops and bottoms, where you get to do the beginning of the scene so the stage manager can see the beginning, mm-hmm. and then you have to do the end so they know when to black out so they can feel uh, the comedy, yeah, yeah, right? Because gotcha, gotcha. you always end on it's, joke. Yeah. Comedy's always timing. Though. You always yeah. end on joke, so they always have to see that joke because sometimes it's a, you know, a long pause or whatever. Right. So we're doing tops and bottoms, and there's this one scene at the very end of the show or it's one one scene before the end of the show, uh, I have to paint the picture. My actors are on stage. I'm in a tech booth with the stage manager because I'm doing more work with them than my yeah. actors. And this tech booth in the, um, I believe it's the DeMott Theater, is like two stories above in the back of the room from yeah, the stage. Yeah, so there. you're very far away. So I'm up there. The actors are doing their thing. Stage manager is kind of running the show. I hadn't talked to my cast all night. And everything's running very well. Yeah. Um, we get to this scene. Uh, this is my biggest nightmare, but also I just I felt so good about this story. I love to share it. <laughs> I tell everyone this story. We get to the scene, and and one of my actors, I love him so much still today, but he decided to do that that thing where you take my setup, but you write your own punchline. He decided to change the blackout joke, um, which again never works. But um, but unfortunately, never works. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this was the day before we had an audience of like seventy five people. So stakes okay. are high. Gotcha. So he gets out there. He does the setup, and he chooses. I don't fault him for it. He chooses a a improvised line where he basically looks out at the audience and tells an audience member who doesn't. He's no, no one's there. I was gonna say there's a run through. Yeah, it's empty. Yeah. No one's there yet, but they're about to be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and he says, hey, after the show, like something along the lines of like, want to have sex with me after the show. Yeah. Okay. A slightly better <laughs> <laughs> joke More than eloquent. That. But very much like, hey, female, 
let's have sex. Very girl, what your name is. Very not what I wrote. Um, (laughs) Never what I write. So I, who have not spoken to these people, he uh, all, all night, and they already kind of, I don't like to say they fear me, but they are respectful of okay. my power. <laughs> they like, listen, you know, when I say something, they listen. I, from two stories above their heads, uh, I open this glass window of the booth and I do it so dramatically. I go on the God mic and I say, halt, like stop. <laughs> the lights come up. The stage manager is like, what's about to happen? And I slowly open this glass panel and it's like, the whole time. Like and I lean, I yeah, it's oh, so awesome. menacing. And I lean out of the window as the director. <laughs> and I stare at the actor and I wait until everyone's like head is peeking out and I can see all them. And then I go, absolutely not. <laughs> and I slowly close. <laughs> the and I've never That's felt good. better. I've just never felt more powerful. It was at life. that moment you knew you were a director. Yeah. It was at that moment that I was like, I got this. Yeah. And then afterwards, I'm in the I, right place. Yeah. Afterwards, this is what I did I'm the long speech doing. of like, may I see everyone? Hey, by the way, we never say to the audience, like, you must have sex with me. And if that happens, I will cancel the whole run. And like, I did the whole teacher spiel later. <laughs> say, yeah, but I had my like Wizard moment. of Oz moment that felt so good. So that's my. That's oh my everyday God. nightmare, but one that had a great ending. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. You're yeah. welcome. Um, so where where can people find you? Where can- um, right now it's called andymaholic.com, which is me, ho, lick, uh, M-E-H-O-L-I-C-K. It is soon to be amlaughs.com, like morninglaughs.com. You're in the middle of a rebrand. We sure are. We're waiting on a graphic designer to hand Uh-oh. over the goods. <laughs> we will be live. Tell him to step his game up. Um, I'm a blogger. I also do shows live at Second City and IO, so you can see me around Chicago. Thanks awesome. for having me awesome. on. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for being on. Much appreciate that. Thanks. Episode one, guys. Woo! Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Genuinely. Love all of you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching the video. Why don't you comment, like, subscribe? Uh, please. Please.